the subject that Pastor Mark suggested that I share is the subject of heroism. What does it mean to be a hero in the Bible? And I'd like to begin with the beginning of the book of Exodus. I think there are important ramifications of this theme that pertain not only to Exodus. Well, you know that um, less than two weeks is the Festival of Lights, Hanukkah, story of the Maccabees. And uh, of course, the great big elephant in the room is we are at war here, as I know you all know. And I know you're all praying for the, uh, the salvation of the Lord that we likewise are praying for here. But again, let's start with Exodus. Because at the beginning of Exodus, we encounter what I'm going to view as three stories of heroism. And uh, the risk of spilling the beans right off the bat at the outset, um, these are all stories, if I use English in the old fashioned traditional sense, that don't have any hero in them because each one is a heroine. <laughs> That's not the drug. That's the, um, the woman who is the hero. And um, let's consider them one by one. Okay, so in Exodus chapter one, we read of the dire straits of Israel. The Egyptians made the children of Israel be enslaved with back-breaking labor and made their lives bitter with hard service and so on and so forth. And then there's a critical shift that takes place in verse 15. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives of whom the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, <clears throat> you shall see upon the birth stool. If it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. And the Bible reports that the midwives feared God. And they did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men and children alive. And, um, of course, we can well appreciate that Pharaoh, absolute ruler that he was, was absolutely accustomed to being obeyed. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and have saved the men and children alive? So they come up with what I have to admit is a pretty lame excuse. The midwife said to the to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered before the midwife comes unto them. And somehow they get away with it, but only provisionally. Now, on the one hand, the Bible emphasizes God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made for them houses. But at first brush, we'll still say they accomplished nothing because Pharaoh charged all his people saying, every son that is born you shall cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. So how do we relate to what they did? And, of course, my first point is going to be speaking up against power is heroism. It's not heroism because you got in some limelight and you accomplished some um, dramatic, earth-shaking event. Because, again, when you consider the thrust of verse 22, you could say they didn't accomplish a thing. 
what makes what they did heroism was because they did what was right. And nothing else mattered. When you do what is right, only because it's right and nothing else, that's heroism. There's another dimension that we should note here with respect to these midwives, and that is, so what do we know about their names? Very possibly absolutely nothing. Because both Shifra and Pua sound to us like they could have been titles and not even names. Why do I say that? Well, remember every word in Biblical Hebrew comes from a three-letter root. Shifra, as in Genesis chapter 49, verse 21, Naphtali is a, is a hen let loose. He gives goodly or beautiful, pleasant words. Goodly, beautiful, pleasant, shafer. Same word as shifra. Likewise, Psalm 16, verse 6. The lines are full and unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly, beautiful, pleasing inheritance. Again, shafera. Same letters as the name shifra. And in Job chapter 26, verse 13, even more overtly, explicitly, by his breath, the heavens are beautified, perfected. Shifra, exactly the same word as the midwife's name, title. The midwife's job, after all, is to beautify, perfect, fix up the baby, when the baby is born. And as for Pua, this may be a little bit less obvious, but the root letters of Pua, Pei, Ain, Hei, for the Hebrew experts, are the same root letters as in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 14, I have long time held my peace, I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing, like a birthing woman. Crying like a birthing woman in the Hebrew, if eh, same root as pu'ah. Well, you know, she's a midwife. She's always with the birthing women. And she knows how to calm down the birthing woman and maybe also the baby who's just been born. So... You wonder, these two midwives, we might not even know who they are. We may have just been given titles obliquely referring to them without even having identities. Mm -hmm. And of course, not only does that not diminish their heroism, that's part of it being anonymous. Because, you know, if you're a real hero, you know why you do what's right. Only because it's right. Not to get your name up on the marquee. You just do it because it's right. Okay, so that's the first act of heroism by these two midwives, Shifra and Pua, whoever they were. Okay, next story of heroism and this is what follows me on the heels of Pharaoh charged all his people saying, every son that is born, you shall cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. And then we read opening verse of chapter two. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. Complete anonymity. We don't know who they were. I mean, we do. But it doesn't say over here. We'll see how we know in a moment. But um, you immediately sense that there's something beyond what meets the eye in this story because, okay, a couple got married. A man of the house of Levi took a wife, daughter of Levi. And then the woman conceived and bore a son. But wait a second, verse four. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. So this little baby has a sister who's old enough to be watching over the baby. The parents should get married. Uh, so, of course, here inevitably we appreciate there's something missing in the text. 
and we look to our tradition to understand what the text is telling us and what our tradition enunciates here is this man of the house of Levi and the wife, the daughter of Levi had already been married they had already been married and indeed you know exactly who they are because in just another four chapters in Exodus chapter 6 we'll read their names and Amram, who is the son of Gehat, who is the son of Levi, took Jochebed, his father's sister, to wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And uh, even though the sister is not mentioned in Exodus chapter 6, she appears explicitly in Exodus chapter 15, Miriam the prophet is the sister of Aaron. And furthermore, in Numbers chapter 26, we read, Kehat begat Amram, and the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt, and she bore unto Amram Aaron and Moses and Miriam, their sister. So we know the whole family from beginning to end. Except in Exodus chapter 2, it doesn't say anything there. Why not? Why not? Because Exodus chapter 2 is a story of heroism. And the Bible is deliberately minimalistic in describing heroes and heroines. We don't accentuate the names because they didn't do it for the names. They didn't do it in order to get their name up in lights. They did what was right because it was right. And what did they do? What was this act of heroism? Well, inevitably we understand chapter 2, verse 1 in light of chapter 1, verse 22. Pharaoh has issued a decree any male babies born are to be thrown in the river. In our tradition, Amram says to Jacheved, his wife, there's no point in continuing family life. Family life means we'll be having children. Having children, if it's a boy, it's just having a baby to be thrown into the river. It's over. Let's separate in order to avoid having children suffering such a horrific fate. And here's where we focus not just on the anonymous parents, but on the anonymous sister, whose name was Miriam. We know that. But in Exodus chapter 2, She's anonymous. And in our tradition, it is Miriam who says to her parents, yeah, your, your decree is harsher than Pharaoh's. Pharaoh only issued a decree against the boys. You can prevent both boys and girls from being born. We have to have faith. That's heroism. And you know, in a way, it's even greater heroism than the heroism of the midwives because the midwives were just standing up to the most powerful ruler on earth. Miriam was standing up to her parents. Her parents whom she loves and respects. Her own. But heroism means speaking the truth no matter to whom no matter for what, no matter the circumstances. And Miriam, the anonymous Miriam, the anonymous sister, is our next heroine in this recounting of the opening verses in Exodus. And then there's the third heroine story in the continuation of Exodus chapter 2. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river and her maidens walked along by the riverside and she saw the ark among the flags and sent her handmaid to fetch it. 
And she opened it and saw it, even the child, and behold, the boy that wept. And she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. <laughs> then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the maiden went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, take this child away and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she called his name Moses and said, because I drew him out of the water. It was her own father who decreed that all the boys were to be drowned in the river. This, if anything, is the pinnacle of heroism, not just because she's standing up to someone who is simultaneously the greatest king on earth and also her own father. It's because she's sticking her neck out for someone who isn't even part of her people. She knows it's a Hebrew baby. And she puts her life on the line for what is right against what is wrong. And that's heroism. So we have these three stories of heroism. The midwives, the daughter, well, we know Miriam, speaking up to her parents and getting them back together again. And the daughter of Pharaoh. And what is striking is that in each case, there are no names. Shifra Pua, titles. The daughter, we know who she is, but in Exodus chapter 2, she's not named. The daughter of Pharaoh, no name. Just daughter of Pharaoh. And this is one really crucial lesson with respect to what constitutes heroism. And we already noted it, but it's important to stress the point further here. There is this tendency in Western society, I want to make a name for myself. If I may share with you, if you're familiar with the prolific author, Holocaust survivor, the late Eli Weisel, in one of his books, Legends of Our Time, he writes in the preface about his visit to a rabbi from his locale, the Rebbe of Vizhnitz. And Wiesel writes that his grandfather, his own grandfather, was more renowned as a follower of this rabbi than he would ever be as an author. And it took him years before he visited this rabbi. As Wiesel writes, not because he didn't know where he was, he knew exactly where he was. The rabbi hadn't changed, but he, Wiesel, had changed profoundly. And he comes into the rabbi's study. And the rabbi mumbles in reminiscence, Dod Yafega's grandson. And Wiesel, who is extremely self-conscious about the extent to which he has changed from the religious fervor of his youth, feels he needs to try to break the ice. So he says, Rabbi, all my life I've been trying to make a name for myself, and to you I'm still my grandfather's grandson. And the rabbi looks up and says to him, so that's what you've been doing all these years? What a pity. And true of the matter is that the obsession with making a name for ourselves didn't begin in Western civilization. It began in Genesis chapter 11. It began with the Tower of Babel. What did those folks say 
Come, let us build us a city and a tower with its top in heaven, and let us make us a name. They want to make a name for themselves. And, you know, as the commentators note with respect to the Tower of Babel, we don't see explicitly what they did was wrong. This is the key. If you're obsessing on making a name for yourself, you're not part of this world. To make a name for yourself means there is the skyline and I want to be sticking up from the skyline. I want to be significant. I want to be important. I want to be a big shot. So that's not your name. That's not your real identity. Your real identity is to be part of the world, to be contributing to the world. If what you're striving for is to set yourself up in opposition to the rest of the world, because that's the way I have a name for myself that's up in lights. You know what I've lost? I've lost my true identity. So ironically, the Greek hero is always aiming to have his name up in lights on the marquee. The biblical hero is anonymous. Because it's not about a name. So what are you doing? How are you contributing to the world? Indeed, in that vein, perhaps the utmost antidote to, I don't make a name for myself, is what we read in Malachi, in chapter 3, verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spoke with one another, and the Lord hearkened and listened. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and the thought upon his name. It's quiet. They just spoke one with another. And two verses later we read, Then shall you again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. Him that really is in there just to serve himself. And this brings us to another set of three acts of heroism. Three acts of heroism, all of Moses. And I'm going to submit that they all are patterned on the three acts of heroism that we saw of those three heroines. I need to just add this background that we have a tradition that Shifra and the Pua, those anonymous midwives, were none other than Jachebed and Miriam. Mm -hmm. So Moses' mother and sister. And the second act of heroism was Moses' sister, Miriam. The third act of heroism, Moses' adopted mother, the daughter of Pharaoh. So he had role models. The women in his life. The first act of heroism, Moses, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown up that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren, and he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he smote the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. First act of heroism. Speak up to power. Do what is right. Because it is right. We'll return to that act of heroism in a moment, but first I just want to see the rest of the list. And he went out the second day, and behold, two men of the Hebrews were striving together, and he said to him that did the wrong, why are you smiting your fellow? And he said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you think to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So, Moses is speaking to one of his own. Yeah, kind of a little bit like Miriam, the anonymous daughter, speaking up to her parents. Because heroism means not just speaking to power in the name of what's right, but also speaking to those who are close to you when they are doing wrong. And the final third act 
of heroism. So when Moses has to run for his life, when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. The priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock, and the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. The third act. Third act. Corresponding to the daughter of Pharaoh, who sticks her neck out for someone who wasn't even from her people. And Moses sticks his neck out for these daughters of the priest of Midian, of course, also aren't his people. And I want to now consider what we're learning from these acts of heroism of Moses. First of all, when Moses sees the Egyptian smiting one of the slaves, you know, we hear the principle enunciated in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 16, you shall not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. And of course, the Torah hasn't been given yet, but this is something that is intuitively obvious. You see evil being perpetrated, you get up and act. And I'll add an additional dimension. This additional dimension is something that in our tradition we learn from Deuteronomy chapter 22. That is, we read there in verse 25, if a man finds damsel that is betrothed in the field, and the man takes hold of her and lies with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. It's considered an act of adultery. But unto the damsel you shall do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man rises against his neighbor and murders him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. We learn from this a principle. If someone is being pursued and is in mortal danger, if that victim is crying out, you go and save him. Even if it means killing the assailant, you go and save him. You have an obligation to save someone whose life is in danger, even in the case of the damsel in distress, someone whose chastity is in danger from the assailant who would overpower the victim. And so Moses sees the Egyptian smiting the Hebrew slave. And what I'm going to stress with respect to what we read in the description, here it is, in Exodus chapter 2, is in verse 12. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he smote the Egyptian and pinned him in the sand. And if you allow me to ask a, a simple-minded pedestrian question, what was he looking for? He looked this way and that way, and when he saw there was no man. So, of course, I readily appreciate that the simple-minded answer to this question is he wanted to check the witnesses, which, of course, is one possibility. But I'd like to submit what, to me, is a more authentic possibility. Moses is a young guy. He sees this gross injustice being perpetrated. And he looks around and says, who's going to get up and do something about it? He looked this way and that way. And he saw there was no man. No one's doing anything. Bingo. I guess I'm the man. I'm the one who needs to act here. No one else is going to do it if I don't. And the moment that Moses comes to this profound realization, we appreciate just who it is whom he is tacitly emulating. In 
Isaiah in various chapters. We read about this summons to be concerned with those who are in difficult straits. In Isaiah chapter 58, the summons to loose the fetters of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, go free and to break every yoke. In Isaiah chapter 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings unto the humble. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the eyes to them that are bound. But in particular, I want to emphasize, in chapter 59, the prophet, in his prophetic eye, beholds God. Truth is lacking. And he that departs from evil is considered mad. And the Lord saw it and displeased, displeased him that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man and was astonished that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. And he put on righteousness as a coat of mail and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Likewise, in Isaiah chapter 63, again, the prophet sees in his prophetic eye, who is this that comes from Edom with crimson garments from Bosra? This that is glorious, splendid in his apparel, stately in the greatness of his power, I that speak with righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his that tread in the wine vat? I have trodden the wine press alone. And of the peoples, there was no man with me. Yea, I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my fury, and their lifeblood is dashed against my heart garments. And I have stained all my raiment for the day of vengeance that was in my heart and my year of redemption are come. And I looked and there was none to help. And I beheld in astonishment and there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arms brought salvation unto me and my fury had upheld me. So when Moses looks this way and that and sees there was no man. That's what Moses realizes up to me because again the true hero does what's right for one reason one reason only because it's right and um, and just to consider the trajectory that then follows okay so he slew the egyptian buried him in the sand next day he encounters a couple of hebrew slaves who are bad-mouthing him to Pharaoh. And he has to run for his life. And he runs from his life for his life from Pharaoh. And he's sitting by a well as a vagabond in Midian. He doesn't know a soul. And, you know, if you'll excuse my making a suggestion here, uh, Moses... Um, <clears throat> Maybe keep a low profile right now. I mean, after all, just two days ago, you got up and did something, and I have, you had to run for your life, and you're at this well now in Midian because you had to run for your life, and you don't know where you're going to go. So, my suggestion, cool it. And what does he do instead? He gets into a war with all the other shepherds to rescue these shepherdesses who he doesn't even know. Is he crazy? And inevitably, what's the answer? He's not crazy. He is driven. Moses is incapable of tolerating witnessing injustice. And the moment that he witnesses injustice, he gets up to write the injustice. Period. End of discussion. Postscript. And that's why God chose him to be the shepherd of his people and to bring his word, the Torah, into the world. Because the first prerequisite is 
if you can sit idly by when injustice is perpetrating, it perpetrated, you're not on this page. If you cannot, if you are driven by that sense of justice, then you can be God's emissary to redeem his people. What has this to do with heroism? Obviously, everything. Heroism is doing what's right because it's right. Heroism is resonating with truth because it's true. Heroism is speaking up to power, speaking to those who are closest to you. Speaking even on behalf of total strangers. Just because you are driven by that sense of what is right and you're not prepared to compromise on it. That's what heroism is really in fine all about. Now, putting things in um, more immediate prosaic context. We noted in less than two weeks time, we celebrate the Festival of Lights, Hanukkah. And what is Hanukkah really truly all about? It's unfortunately something that is often watered down, um, adulterated, or even just faked in order to make it palatable to Western society. Hanukkah commemorates a band of uncompromising, zealous Jews who, when confronting a society, and it's not so much the Greeks, it was the Hellenized Jews who have turned their back on the word of God were absolutely uncompromising because they felt driven by a sense of justice, historic justice, if you will, in being faithful to God, even if it meant, like our stories of heroism, standing up against their own, which they did. That's the message of heroism. And it's the point of self-sacrifice. Because you know, the sons of Mattathias, the Maccabees, one by one, each fell in battle. Only one survived. Because when you do what's right, you're not doing what's right in order to start a dynasty. You're not doing what's right in order to get your name up in lights. You're doing what's right, simply because it's right. And um, that inevitably brings me also to want to share with you a little bit of what's been going on here the past few weeks. If I can appropriate one small story from among so very, very many. I, uh, I saw a, a video clip about this just a couple of weeks ago. And um, the manner in which the story was recounted was so moving. It brought me to tears. The story was conveyed by two older men. One of them, a Jew, a father of a husband, together with 
his wife, who were murdered on October 7th, on the day of the unspeakable, obscene atrocities that were perpetrated by the terrorists. The elder, older man, a Bedouin Arab, whose son was murdered at the same time. And this was their story. The husband and wife were out with their two young daughters in the city of Sederot when the Hamas terrorist marauders roared into the city. They practically took over the whole city, shooting at everyone. And the husband tried to take up a position to protect his wife and children and almost instantly was shot and killed. And his wife, well, now widow, is in a car with these two young children. And she froze. And just passing by at that moment was this young man, he was also a young father, Bedouin Arab. And he sees the woman is frozen in the car. And he appreciates just how serious the situation is. And he takes the wheel and drives the car to what anyone would have thought would be the safest spot in town, the central police station in Sderot. Except, as you may know, the police station in Sderot, the main police station in the city, had just been the site of a pitched battle and the terrorists were in control of the police station. And of course, they see this car and they realize that it isn't their fellow terrorists and they unleash a barrage of bullets, killing both the Bedouin Arab man and the young woman who was just widowed when her husband was shot dead. And ironically, you know, when after the carnage was over, the rescue teams found this bullet ridden car, their immediate thought was that the Bedouin had commandeered the vehicle as a terrorist act until they realized, no, he was there to try to save them. He didn't succeed in saving this young woman. He didn't succeed in saving himself. They both died in that hail of bullets. But you know, those two little kids who were in the back seat miraculously survived. And I hope you join with me in, of course, weeping, mourning over all of these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of innocent victims who are so ruthlessly murdered, butchered, chopped up alive, incinerated while yet alive. <coughs> and yet with all those tears, weep also for this young couple, the husband shot dead, the wife likewise 
murdered in the hail of bullets, and this young Bedouin man who left behind a wife with two children who will grow up as orphans from their father, just as those two little girls will grow up as orphans from both their parents because of the evil incarnate that was brought to bear on that dreadful day. But when evil incarnate is the choice that some people made that day. And we're not going to call them animals. They weren't animals. They were people. People created in the image of God. God's essence imprinted upon them who could have chosen the path of righteousness and chose through exercise of their own free will to become the monsters that they became. They made their choices. And others made their choices. And that young Bedouin man really personifies, to my mind, the heroism. The heroism of the daughter of Pharaoh who stands up to her father's domineering wickedness and reaches out to save a little Hebrew baby. And the heroism of that little baby grown up when Moses is that fugitive, vagabond, sitting by the well in Midian, and he gets up in order to save those gals from the shepherds who were banishing them from the well. And um, I hope what we're sharing right now can be dedicated to their memory, to the memory of all of the righteous who demonstrated through their deeds they weren't looking for the accolades. They weren't looking for awards. They weren't looking for a name. They were just looking to do what's right. And it's precisely at that moment when there are others who are choosing evil incarnate that we also have the wherewithal to choose the good. And when we do, I'm going, I'm going to read these verses. Of the peoples, there was no man with me. I looked and there was none to help. And I beheld in astonishment and there was none to uphold. And when you chose to stand with God at that moment, all by yourself, you may be alone with respect to your fellow man, but you're not alone. You will never be alone because you're standing alone with God. God bless you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so very much, Kai. That was just fantastic. I really enjoyed that teaching. Thank you. God bless you, Pastor Mark. Oh, bless you too. I mean, I took a lot of notes. I took a lot of notes. <laughs> and uh, I know everyone, I don't know if you want to unmute yourselves, you can jump in now uh, <laughs> if you have any questions for Kai. But uh, we really appreciate everything that you said and done. God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share, Pastor Mark. I'm extremely grateful. As I, uh, as I told you, I, I felt so badly that you weren't able to get together with me here in Jerusalem. And I is, know. I wish. Is, well, maybe next year maybe we're looking at planning a trip, I think, okay. September 1st through the 12th of next year. But okay. uh, you may be coming here in March. Right. God willing. God willing. So we'll have that also as a, uh, a consolation prize. But it's not, yeah. it's not something if you're coming here. Oh, I know. We'd love to be home. <laughs> we got to come home. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all of your hard work and effort. Uh, I know everyone here appreciates everything that you do. And of course, everyone's so concerned about what's going on over in Israel right now. We're just so glad that hostages are being released. Yeah, but uh, well, it's a, just what, what, of course, we realize that <clears throat> whatever the terrorists are going to do, it's all going to be in order to preserve themselves and um, of course yeah 
Of course. It's just one of those things where no matter which way you go, there's going to be problems. You just have to pick the less of the two words. Right. For sure. Well, is there anything um, else that you would want us to know at this time juncture in history? Um, What's on your heart? Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, well, what I'd like to share is um, an off the track um, proposition. And uh, I, I have to admit that. I don't have any definitive way of being able to establish the history behind it, but, uh, but it's still something that um, I just I have this, this sense that there's something underlying it. Um, you know, while the date of the commemoration of Hanukkah obviously doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible because Hanukkah is, well, post-biblical. And yet, simultaneously, actually, I think we, we, we talked about one aspect of this once um, a few years back. Um, simultaneously, we do read about this date in yeah, yeah. connection with the Holy Temple, uh, let me just find the, uh, the the appropriate verse here. Uh, second, um, uh, here we are. Um, Um, mm -hmm. I think it is Haggai. Yes, it is. It definitely is. I'm just looking for the exact for for. I know I have it. I, I have the text. In um, on the, on hold on, I I find it for you. I have uh, it. Uh, uh, it only three chapters. Oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, well, no, no. So, so, so I have a passage from Haggai. You're right. It definitely is in Haggai. That Haggai speaks of the dedication of the second temple. See if I can... Chapter two, verse one, is where it talks about yeah. the seventh month and the 20th day. One second. Right. Uh, one second. <laughs> From the uh, verse 18. Yeah, okay. Where was... Ah, here we are, right. Um, verse 18. Um, Consider, I pray you, from this day and forward from the 24th day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. And um, just historically, it was on that date that the Syrian Greeks defiled the Holy Temple. And it was three years later that the dedication of the temple took place, of course, on Hanukkah, which has since then been observed uh, the night of the 24th, and it was the eve of the 25th, is the first night of Hanukkah. And um, you get this sense that there was something that was really of critical importance with respect to this time of year, and inevitably, I feel compelled to note to you folks, I'm sure you're aware of this as well, that 25th, the 25th of December was a Roman festival, and it enabled the early Christians to conceal their celebration because the pagan Romans were celebrating at the same time. You know about this, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So now, so what was the significance? 25th of Kislev, 25th of December. What's going on here? And what I feel compelled to share with you is we have this ancient tradition 
that when Adam and Eve saw that the days are getting shorter and shorter, their immediate conclusion was, it's curtains. God is bringing the world to a close. The days are getting shorter, and eventually it's just going to go dark. The lights are getting turned off. And so they, they fasted. And they fasted specifically through the winter solstice. And you know, after the solstice, the days start getting longer in the northern hemisphere. And they realize the world isn't over. And uh, so we have this tradition that those days that they fasted, when they thought the world was going dark, they observed subsequently as days of celebration, of festivals, that initially were dedicated to serving God and giving thanksgiving to God. And over the course of time, you can imagine what happened. Over the course of time, these days were appropriated, misappropriated, and transformed into pagan festivals. And I'm going to uh, propose that um, being transformed into pagan festivals, on the one hand, um, that was the reason that the Greeks defiled the temple on the 25th of the month of Kislev. And moreover, that was the reason that God told the prophets, Chagai and Zechariah, and Zechariah to dedicate the second temple on that date in foretelling that eventuality. And of course, that was also the reason that after the defilement of the Holy Temple, the rededication took place on the 25th. And it was because the same pagan obsession that the Romans made the 25th of December into the pagan festival. And again, the early Christians needed a day when they would be able to hide their identity because you know what was going on in Rome when they would get their hands on a Christian. And, uh, you know, excuse me, but they became lion food. You're aware of that. And oh, yeah. um, so, uh, so what I'd like to propose is, you know, people try to conflate Hanukkah and Christmas, and of course, they're completely different holidays. But what they signify in different ways is a way of responding to that pagan orientation that was manifest in the Greeks and <clears throat> in the pagan Romans. And it's specifically focused on the winter solstice. And what's the significance of the winter solstice? Simply this. The world really is going dark. And if you don't believe me, just look around. What a dark world we live in. And I'm not just talking about the day length in the Northern Hemisphere right now. I mean, on so many, so many levels. A world, a world that has turned its back on God, a world that has turned its back on truth, a world that has turned its back on decency, a world that has turned its back on the family, a world that has turned its back on anything sacred. And, of course, simultaneously, again, we remember this message that Moses looks this way and that way and he sees there's no man because bingo, this is the place that's waiting for me to act. And uh, I want to bless all of us that we should be able to discern in this profound, profound darkness. We, we sense this, this darkness so oppressively here uh, I don't want to sound paranoid, but the whole world has turned against us. And, um, you know, the old line goes, uh, even if you are paranoid, it doesn't mean that everyone is not, isn't out to get you. 
in this case, they really are. Um, and um, and simultaneously, it just takes a little bit of light to dispel a lot of darkness. And uh, you know, those Kanaka lights are really tiny, but they go a long way to dispelling the darkness. And I hope all of us together can indeed project that light in the dark world we live in. And I pray that we'll be able together to experience that glorious light that we know is at the end of this tunnel. It's a light that only comes from God. Amen. And, um, and you know, coming from Jerusalem, I'll still add, you know, we have a, uh, a saying in our tradition, Jerusalem is the light of the world. That's the right. Of, and the light of Jerusalem is God. So, um, so may we indeed live together. As Pastor Mark <clears throat> likes to say, one shoulder can join That's twins. Right. That's right. So we'll be able to welcome God's light. May it speedily shine upon us. Amen. I can't help but think of Proverbs 6, 23, where it says the commandment is a lamp and the Torah is light. The Torah, that's God's word. That's what we need to have shine in this darkness. That's the only thing that's going to end up shining is what the almighty creator has told us. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining with us. I'm sure we will have him again before he comes in March. We thank you so much. Oh, man, the sooner the better. And, 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 and no one has anything to say. I, I, I'd be, be really thrilled if people would speak up. No? Goodness gracious, not even the cameras are on. <laughs> thank you so much for your time, for doing this. We appreciate you. and We truly are praying for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. Looks like everybody has their picture off too. They all want to be concealed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, the the Mark, videos. Pastor Mark, I do apologize. I would have. Well, a question. Hi. 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 Oh, it is me, Sylvia. Um, yeah, this Sylvia is from Germany. Oh, oh. I'm, born in, I'm born in Poland. I do apologize. I'm born in Poland. Hold on, video. Mm -hmm. Let's see if you can see me. I try my best. Pastor Mark, I would have a question. Um, regarding your um, sermon last night, I would send an email to you. Please check your emails. I sure will. Thank you very much. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anybody else want to jump in? Please. It's a fellowship, so please. Where is my oh. hold on? Where's my picture? Thank well, you. Okay. I am kind of new in learning here. Did I understand that the Maccabee War started on the 25th of December? Is that right? No, there's, no I uh, messed up. It was, it was that the, 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 the truth of the matter is that the wars of the Maccabees stretch over a period of around 20 years, actually over 20 years. Um, the, um, the, the first phase of the fighting was against the Syrian Greeks. The Greeks defiled the temple on the 25th of Kislev, the, the Hebrew month of Kislev. And three years later, after the Maccabees had ousted the Greeks from the temple itself, they were able to rededicate the temple on the 25th of the month of Kislev. But, but the reality is, while Kislev and December you know, nowadays are not at all in sync with one another, um, in antiquity, months, you know, the word month comes from moon. The months really were in step with the lunar calendar. So at some point, undoubtedly, the 25th of December was the 25th of Kislev. Okay. It isn't nowadays, but um, well, once it was. Uh -huh. And again, I, and, and I'm, I'm just, I, I imagine that this key of the winter solstice that was made into the occasion for this pagan celebration was on the one hand, the reason that the Greeks defiled the temple on the 25th, and also the reason the Romans, because, you know, the Romans, excuse me, the Romans didn't really have any, any independent culture or religion. They just basically appropriated everything with the Greeks. So the, the Romans 
had this pagan festival also on the 25th of December, which was the day that Christians were able to camouf camouflage their celebration because the Romans were having their pagan festival at the same time. Got it. Okay. And that whole analogy of um, Moses looking to and fro because he was the only one. And I mean, I would have never even thought of that. It, it's always been thought of that it was just, did anybody see me? You know, and now I, I got to hide. You know, so that was a really, really neat explanation. I like that a lot better. Yeah, and, you, know, and, 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 you know, I didn't, I didn't go through the text in the Hebrew, but I have to tell you, it's almost exactly the same words. That is, the, 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 the phraseology is the same phraseology, and you can't help but think this isn't incidental. That is, the way Moses is expressing himself is exactly the way Isaiah describes God as as seeing that there is none with him when he uh, brings about the salvation of the world. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? I want to say I really appreciate this is uh, Mike uh, everything I'm I'm it's all swirling in my head and just like the you know Adam and Eve seeing that it, it's getting dark and then you know the the menorah it stays lit and the light is there and possibly uh, Yeshua was uh, conceived the light came into the world in that same time I mean uh, everything I'm sure to the same day. It's just, uh, you know, as it's going to be dark and then, and then God's like, no, I got light for you. I don't know. There's just too much. I, I got to I gotta study, but I appreciate you just stirring it all up in me. Thank you. But, you know, I was just with respect to the, the menorah, I mean, the, the, um, the point is definitely well taken regarding the menorah. And uh, if I can share with you in particular, um, uh, when we read of the construction of the holy temple in the book of kings so there's a, uh, a somewhat enigmatic verse in the first book of kings chapter 6 verse 4 that um for the house as for the sanctuary he made windows wide outside and narrow inside and you know the uh, the Bible scholars know, you know that the intuitive way to make a house is the other way around. That is, to admit the ambient light from outside, you make the windows wide on the inside. But of course, the message is that this is not to admit ambient light from outside. On the contrary, it is for the light of the menorah to be broadcast outside into the world into the dark world in which we live. And um, of course, that is not uh, merely some uh, facile optical light, but as Pastor Mark expressed it, you know, as we read in Proverbs chapter six, verse 23, the commandment is a lamp, the Torah is light. And, uh, and maybe in, in even broader terms, the expression that we find in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6, and chapter 49, verse 6, I have set you as a covenant of the people, as a light of the nations, and ultimately the consequence of that, if we read in Isaiah chapter 60, arise, shine, for your light is come, the glory of the, of the Lord is shown upon you, for behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness, the peoples, but upon you, the Lord will shine and his glory will be seen upon you and nations will walk at your light and kings at the brightness of your shining. So ultimately, it's, it's all about rise and shine. Get, get the, uh, the darkness to, um, to be illuminated because, you know, it just takes a little bit of light to dispel a whole lot of darkness. Amen. Yeah. Uh, one one last thing there with everything that you were you're teaching I, I see that as like Moses and, and and all these heroes it was very dark everything around everything around the people that they, they were and they were the light in the middle of that whole thing whichever each hero was a, a light that um, um, into those situations it's like awesome 
Absolutely. That everyone, whenever you do what's right, you're illuminating the darkness. That, that's uh, that's axiomatic, and that's really more than anything else that great summons and the great blessing, the great opportunity that God gives us. If I can, um, I can share with you a experience that I had uh, a number of years ago. I was speaking in a large church in Osnabrück, Germany. And I don't remember exactly what was going on, what I was saying, but I remember at some point, a little old lady um, raised her hand and said, I was saying something about establish, establishing God's kingdom on earth. And she got up and said, she's not looking forward to the establishment of God's kingdom because she has God's kingdom in her heart. Yeah. And, you know, at that moment, you think to yourself, okay, so what am I supposed to say right now? God, please put the right words in my mouth. And the words that came were, well, you know, we read in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, I have given you as a light of the nations that my salvation will be to the end of the earth. It's a wonderful thing that God's kingdom is in your heart. But if you're not doing your utmost to bring God's salvation to the end of the earth, you're not doing your job. Mm -hmm. We're not finished yet. You have to stand up. So. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Anyone else? Let's share. Uh, Shalom, Rabbi. Yeah, shalom, shalom. Good to see you. Gerald, yes. Ari. yeah, and, and again, I want to thank Mark and you for for hosting hosting this. It's really good to see this, and we hope it continues. Uh, I have a question. Uh, we talk about the light and everything emanating, um, and the light seems to be coming from Jerusalem. And so, my question is: Is do you feel like the consensus of rabbis to uh, the Garden of Eden being in Jerusalem. Do you feel like there's a consensus of rabbis that, that believe that to be true? Because it seems like in Christianity, they're trying to place the Garden of Eden, you know, somewhere in Africa or, you know, somewhere back east or something. And, and it seems to me like the weight of scripture says that the Garden of Eden emanates from Jerusalem, which is why, you know, there's, there's so much attention on Jerusalem, uh, you know, for the world and everything. What do you think about that? Okay, so uh, um, Pastor Mark, do I have a few minutes to answer this? This is a, this is a, a, a profound issue. Okay. You're, you're muted, but I think you're, I think you're saying yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, I absolutely love that question. Okay, okay so, great. Yeah, okay. I, I want to okay. hear your thoughts on that. Okay, great. So what I'm going to say, um, the truth is that, that we have, what we do have in our tradition is that when Adam and Eve were sent forth from the Garden of Eden, and um, I want to emphasize those words, sent forth, because Chapter 3, verse 23. Migan Eden. God sent forth Adam and Eve. The following verse speaks of banishment, but verse 23 is sent forth, like sent on a mission. God sent them forth to work the earth whence they had been taken. And we conflate the earth from which they had been taken with the altar of earth of which we read in Exodus chapter 20 that they went forth from the garden and sat on the Temple Mount because the gates of the garden are adjacent to the Temple Mount. Now, I have an obvious question here. You tell me the gates of the garden are adjacent to the Temple Mount, but I don't see the garden. So what's going on? So I have a um, somewhat um, offbeat proposition. Pastor Mark, I think I shared, I shared this with you once, but in any case, if, you, if you'll allow me to share it again. Um, sure. my, my proposition is 
we need, before we talk about where the garden is, before we understand the gates of the Garden of Eden, to talk about something else, something else that admittedly does not appear anywhere explicitly in the Bible. And that is the foundation stone. Right. That is, what is the foundation stone? Um, we read about the foundation stone in the um, uh, the Mishnah in speaking of the what, what what was inside the holy of holies of the temple. It's really, in some sense, based upon what we read in Isaiah chapter twenty eight, verse sixteen. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a fortress stone, a costly cornerstone of sure foundation. He that believe it shall not make haste. And the Mishnah tells us that the ark, the holy ark, was not in the second temple. Once the ark was taken, a stone was there from the days of the early prophets, which refers to David and Samuel because they laid the, grand, they laid the groundwork of the temple. And it was called foundation. And when the high priest on the Day of Atonement would place the censer in the Holy of Holies, he would place it upon this stone. And, and what's the meaning of foundation stone in Hebrew? Eben Shetiah. Um, and tradition is from it the world was founded which of course obviously that raises an, you know, transparently a question what do you mean the world was founded I mean after all uh, it's not like we're flat earthers the, we don't believe that uh, it's like rolling out the, the earth with a, with a rolling pin right um, and here's my proposal that you know when we conceive, to the extent that we can conceive of it, when we can conceive of the process of creation, in the realm of God, there is no physicality, of course, at all. But here there is. So we see this process of creation as a series of emanations from God from a realm that is entirely transcendent until eventually it becomes our world. And there's a point at which there is what we can describe as a phase transition and physicality begins. That point where physicality begins is the foundation stone. That means on this side of the foundation stone, we live in a physical universe. On the other side of the foundation stone, and when I say the other side, I don't mean north side, south side, east side, or west side. I mean inside. There's no physicality at all. It's a different level of existence. And... Um, this might start sounding a little bit like Star Trek or science fiction, but that means the foundation stone is like a portal. It's the, the, the bottom floor, so to speak, of this portal, this elevator. When you enter it, you get to higher levels. That's why in Kings 1, first book of Kings, chapter 8, King Solomon describes all of the prayers from all of the world as focused upon the place of the temple. Because, so to speak, it is through the temple that all the prayers, so to speak, go to heaven. Yeah. And there is on this, um, this elevator, it's portal, there is a, le a level that is the Garden of Eden. 
And if you ask me, where's the Garden of Eden in this world? My answer is, it's not in this world. They, they've pretty well mapped out all of the geography of planet Earth, and there's no Garden of Eden here. That doesn't mean the Garden of Eden isn't real. It is absolutely real. But it's a different level of existence. You need to get into that portal and you press the button that says Garden of Eden in order to be able to get to the Garden of Eden. Of course, you can't do that because it's off limits. But it's a different level of existence. When Adam and Eve were sent <clears throat> out of the Garden of Eden, they get into this portal and they come out at the foundation stone on the Temple Mount. So that means that the foundation stone proper and the Temple Mount in general, and by extension, the Holy Land, is the focal point of holiness, of spirituality, of yeah. this physical world. Uh, and um, again, you're not going to be able to find the Garden of Eden, but like you Indiana know. Indiana Jones. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but you know that the gate of the Garden of Eden is that portal, and that's at the foundation stone. So um, <clears throat> that's my I proposition. Something about I believe I heard something about Heaven's Gate last night by somebody's teaching. Yeah, well, Sorry. the interesting thing about Heaven's Gate, that was the name that Israel called it when the hostages were brought out. It was called the Gate of Heaven okay. Operation. And here the Torah portion is about Heaven's Gate this same That's weekend. Really interesting, oh, cool. right? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and of course, you know, the truth is that, that this, this expression that we encounter in Genesis chapter 28, where Jacob says, This is none other than the house of the Lord, and this is the gate of heaven. He has this extraordinary vision. Note, he doesn't say, Oh, I should have had that Mexican food last night. He also, he also doesn't say, Wow, I have some really neat visions. He says, It's all the place. It's the place. The place. Yeah is what conferred upon me this ability to connect because this is the gate of heaven. And, oh, um, and you know, but by the same token, I'll also state, um, if we seek a, a, um, a correspondent to this idea of the gate of heaven or the, the the bridge between heaven and earth. There's another passage that's critical here. It's from several hundred years afterward. First book of Chronicles, chapter 21. The, the devastating plague that God sends after King David conducts a census illicitly. And what we read there in verse 15 and on. I'm going to read, if I can just share with you um, a, a few verses here. Begin with verse 15. And verse 15 is clearly like an intro to what follows. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was about to destroy, the Lord beheld. And he repented him of the evil and said to the destroying angel, it is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord. Now, pay careful attention to the next words. Standing between the earth and the heavens, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. And David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. Now, clearly in context, just want to point out, verse 15 was the general header. Verse 16 is beginning the detailed story of exactly what happened. That is, David sees this vision of the angel standing between the earth and the heavens. And we ask ourselves, where can you stand between the earth and the heavens? At this spot. The threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And in verse 18, after the plague has been withdrawn, the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. 
And where's the threshing for of Ornan the Jebusite? Second book of Chronicles. Yeah. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father, for which provision had been made in the place of David in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. That's the spot. That's the spot. That's between earth and heaven. That's the spot where the portal is, where everything gets connected. Yeah, I, I really believe. Yeah, I, I really believe that Jerusalem is where the Garden of Eden was beyond a shadow of a doubt. Of course, topography changes after Noah's flood and everything else. But again, but I'm, many, I'm going to say, no, the garden is still yeah. there. Right, not, right. That's, not, what, that's what I was going to go can't access to. it in this world. Right, right. The gate is here. Though, right. I understand. Because the I elevator is that, here. Right. Oh, yeah, well, who knows? How many layers of uh, of a tell that they have? The ridge, hey, that's enough. My dog's going crazy. One thing that I thought was fascinating uh, when I was looking at it, when God created the heavens and the earth, uh, you'd have to look at the Hebrew and tell me exactly what the word planted meant. But well, the Garden of Eden... But the Garden of Eden, it almost looks like, wasn't part of creation. It says, then the Lord God planted the garden. Right. So, so he here you have, the Eden. Right, right. And so he planted it. It's almost like a parent wanting to get the nursery ready for the kid before he comes. And, and so here we have the Lord almost literally planting the garden. I'd have to look at the word plant. And I find that so fascinating that then... Adam was taken from a different spot of the earth, and he's moved into the garden uh, that. Well, see, again, I'm not going. I'm not going to say. It. Wait, but it's not. I'm not going to say it's a completely different part of Earth, because see, again, I'll say that when when Adam and Eve are sent forth from the garden, the the um, the, the formulation, of course, is that God sent them forth to work the earth from right. whence they had been from, from which they had been taken right. in, in other words um there's one side and there's the other side so to speak yep. there's the there's the gateway that separates the earth from which they had been taken and and in our, in our tradition we're going to associate that earth ha'adama yep with exodus chapter 20 verse 20 an altar of earth adama yep. same word yep they'll make unto me so the spot of the altar is the spot from which adam and eve had been taken and when they're sent forth from the garden it is to that spot so that's why when they leave the garden they're on the temple mount and that's the spot from which they were taken same place right. I, yep i think it's fascinating that just as moses's tabernacle was the pattern after the heavenly tabernacle i believe in one sense Everything here on earth, a lot of it is uh, what is up in heaven. Like when there's wars, the, in the book of Daniel, there was a war going on during the first month, and the messenger couldn't get to him for 21 days. It was from the 3rd of Nisan to the 24th of Nisan. And it's like that you have heavenly battles going on. Well, I believe a lot of the battles on earth are echoes of the one uh, in the other sphere. We, so we we do have this tradition that the, the, the that there's a there's a um, a consonance between what yeah. happens down below and what's happening up above. Now, obviously, it's important for us to appreciate, and this it, it really strikes it as a, at a a profoundly deep message. After all, those officers about whom we read in Daniel of Greece, of Persia, they're angels. You're right. That is, they are part of, so to speak, God's holy retinue. And if you ask, so what, what, what do we mean when we talk about these, these battles taking place? It's important for us to appreciate, on the contrary, the fact that every nation is associated with an angel in principle is profoundly redemptive. 
Yep. Because it means that every nation has a role to play yep. in the divine scheme of things. That is, the way God creates the world, ultimately, every nation is to contribute to the grand cosmic symphony yes. that all the nations will be playing. And, and if you want uh, um, maybe the most explicit scriptural verse that enunciates that, um, personally, I'm going to cite Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. It will come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of God's house will be set up at yeah. the head of mountains and uplifted above hills, and all nations will stream to it. Uh, yeah. What's the proof here? What's the proof here? Of course, on the one hand, it, it's obvious, it's important to stress this point, they're not coming as Israel. There's no mission to convert all the nations to being Jews. But there's another side of this coin. They are not coming as undifferentiated humanity. They are coming as nations, which yep, tells yep. me that these national groupings have significance, have spiritual significance in the yeah. end of days when they're all coming to the Temple Mount. Yeah. Because that's the mission, that all the nations should attain that redemptive role as part of this cosmic symphony in declaring the majesty of the Lord. So the resonance between the heavenly retinue, the angels that are charged with each nation, the archetypal nations, and the nations themselves is profoundly redemptive because it's telling you that every nation has a role to play in this. Right. Uh, the only thing is, um, the fly in the ointment is, we all have free will. <laughs> free will is wonderful, because it means you can make yourself into a partner with God in creation. What the hallelujah. The only thing is, um, it's also possible to mess up. And to take that unique spiritual endowment that each nation has that is the angel in the heavenly retinue through which that nation is, is summoned to make its unique contribution to the glory of God. But that entails seeing that spiritual endowment, that angel, of course, as what it is, as subservient to the Lord, as means to the end of serving God. What if instead the nation obsesses on that angel and makes it into an end in itself? Yeah. What do we call that? Idolatry. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's paganism. That's paganism. That's exactly what paganism is. And uh, and and that, and not only is that profoundly corrupting to the nation, it impinges upon. Indeed, maybe the worst sin of doing that is what it perpetrates against that angel, because in the angel, instead of being what the angel was created to be as a means to bringing the nation to God is encumbered by becoming a uh, an object of worship by this pagan nation. So we need to redeem. We need to redeem all the nations. We and and by redeeming all these nations, then so we're we're redeeming the um, the heavenly retinue, so to speak, created by God and restoring everything to its divine source. That's a um, that's a mighty ambitious goal, but we we won't settle for anything less than that. That's the goal. <laughs> that's Bring right. the entire world back to God. That's again. I'm going to go back to Isaiah chapter forty nine verse six. That my salvation will be to the end of the earth. Of the earth. There won't be one single solitary nook or cranny anywhere on earth, anywhere in the universe, that will not be filled with the glory of God. If we haven't done that, we haven't done our job. We got more work to do. That's right. 
Well, again, thank you, everybody. If you want to stay on, you can. I've got to run. <laughs> but uh, blessings to all of you. And we will try this again sometime uh, soon. Please, thank the sooner you the better. Again. All right. Okay. You take care. Bye. Thank you. Shalom to all of you. And, and may we indeed be blessed with good Amen. tidings of God's salvation to share in abundance always. Amen. Shalom. Pastor Mark, please have a look in your email, in your emails. Blessings. Bye-bye. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you.